Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. A couple pieces of news. One, you have the senior VP resigns. So that's Drew Baglino. That's one part of the story. The other part of the story is that the car maker slashing headcount uh, by about 10%. So put those two things together. And what does that tell us about where Tesla is right now? So joining us is Steve Mann, Bloomberg Intelligence, Global Autos, and Industrial Research Analyst. This is a great example of why Bloomberg Intelligence Radio can bring you the best analyst from all of our guys all around the world. And Steve is definitely one of them. What has been your take over the last few hours on management shakeups as well as headcount at Tesla? Well, it's actually worse than I thought. I thought, uh, you know, the first quarter sales drop was, you know, hopefully uh, close to the end. But, you know, there's seems to be the light at the end of the tunnel is not really here yet. And it looks like, you know, it's running. Their plants are running just pretty much well below capacity at the moment. And there's still a lot of uh, uh, cost headwinds facing them. They're trying to balance a lot of things in terms of deliveries, production. They're raising prices. I don't know how long that's going to last. So execution is risk. Uh, execution is key for the company in the next, uh, you know, six to, to nine months. So, Steve, where are we now, or where is the market when you talk to investors in terms of getting a sense of where EV demand is uh, in the U.S. and then maybe globally? Well, EV demand is uh, is waning. I think the interest rate is not helping. You know, it's uh, they're looking to you know, as you know, the the Fed's probably not going to cut rates anytime soon uh, in the next uh, couple of months, next quarter or so. So that's going to continue to weigh on big purchases like automobiles. We're seeing that across the board um, in uh, in the U.S. as well as in China. China's a little bit worse for Tesla because it's, there's so much new competition there. Um, but, uh, you know, sales is slowing for GM. Sales is slowing for Ford. Ford just had to cut production uh, of their Lightning uh, recently announced about a couple of weeks ago. So I, I think this year will be tough for the industry. Um, now, you know, we probably won't see any improvement until, uh, to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, 2026. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that pushes it away out. Here was interesting headline, too, Paul, to your point, is that Reuters is reporting uh, that BP is cutting over 100 jobs in its electric vehicle charging unit. And we all talk about how we really need yeah. chargers yep. to deal with the range anxiety. And now you have a big player here uh, shutting some jobs in its EV uh, charging unit. Steve, why 2026? Why is it going to take that long? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think what the, the market the EV market is is facing today is that we had early adopters, especially on the high end. Um, they're you know they're pretty much tapped out. You know they they can buy only so many. The market is relatively small, smaller than the mass market. Uh, I, I'm looking at 2026 because if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, um, it's bringing in uh, onshoring a lot of the EV battery production in the U.S. Hopefully, it will cut costs. And at the same time, uh, in 2026, we're, we're looking at more affordable EVs coming into the market. That's going to expand the addressable market for EVs. And that's why we're, we're, we're thinking, you know, 2026 will probably be a better uh, time for the EV market than it is today. So how about profitability in that scenario, Steve? It's tough to make an argument that, you know, these EVs can be profitably manufactured at a higher price point. How are they going to adjust their cost structure to get be profitable at maybe a, a lower price point? I don't know, thirty thousand dollars or something like that. Uh, that's a good question. I think if you look at the EV startups <clears throat> in the U.S., um, it, you know the, the only one that's really still profitable is Tesla. Um, you saw Fisker <clears throat> being delisted. There's risk of them fil- filing bankruptcy. Both Lucid and Rivian will need a you know, billions of dollars just to get them through the next couple of years. We're not sure if they're going to get that money given the, the slowdown in the EV market. But uh, on the bright side, I think Tesla is still generating cash. You know, they're making some of the cuts today, I think, really to maintain cash generation so they can continue to invest for the long term. Mm-hmm. You know, for them, I think 
what's really important for them um, is, is the AI, the, the FSD, the self, uh, full self-driving uh, system that they're trying to build out. Um, that, that's going to be the future of the automotive industry. It's really those software-based subscriptions that's going to drive revenue not so much of uh, the automaking. So if they're trying to get there, trying to maintain cash, maintain some level of profitability, profitability to make those investments to get them there. Uh, interesting, I was thinking about self-driving as I was coming up the Taconic, or going down the Taconic <laughs> yesterday, and I was like, would I want to be in a self-driving car right now in the Taconic? I don't know were, the answer to that. You were driving? I was driving, and I was like, I don't know, man. I think I want to trust myself behind the wheel. Anyway, before we let you go, Steve, um, let's go to the SVP departing. So Drew Baglino, um, mm. he uh, leaving the company, as I mentioned, senior vice president. Uh, wh who is he? Do we care? Like how big a deal he was in Tesla? What did he do? Walk us through it. Yeah, we, we do care. He's, he's, you know, I think <clears throat> he's the face of, he's also the face of Tesla. Seems to be, looks like to be the right hand person for Elon Musk. So it's a big loss for the company, no doubt about it. Uh, but you know, he's a, he's a powertrain engineer uh, for the most part, uh, energy engineer. So he's, you know, he's really involved in the battery. If you saw him on battery day, uh, I think, mm. you know, if you look at Tesla and what Elon Musk have been saying about Tesla's future, which is on AI, which is on full self-driving, um, is it a big loss? I mean, you can, you can argue that, hey, you know, Tesla is moving on to the next phase. It's not about building the, the motors, not about building the batteries. They've gone through that process over the past 15, 18 years. You know, I think, you know, looking forward, uh, they probably need somebody, more people around, you know, L AI, you know, development algorithms uh, for the future of the car. All right, Steve Mann, thanks so much for joining us. As always, Steve Mann, he covers uh, the global auto industry for Bloomberg Intelligence based down there in Princeton, New Jersey. It's got to be tough, I think, to be like a Kathy Wood, to be so invested in this company, you know, not only financially, but kind of reputationally, and to have that, to deal with an, uh, a CEO like Elon Musk is so mercurial, I guess mm -hmm. is maybe the right term. And, and one of the, you know, the results of that is, you know, executive turnover, and that's got to be really challenging for investors. Yeah, but you know what's interesting with her view is that it's so long term that I wonder yeah. if these things become just blips to her. I yeah. don't know. Yep. Uh, on, on the other on the other side of it. Yeah, she's very, you know, obviously had great success with this disruption uh, mm -hmm. kind of theory, but boy, you gotta ride with Elon Musk and his foibles. It's, it's true, yeah, no, that, that'd be really hard. Would you do self-driving, by the way? In Absolutely not. Yeah, okay, Absolutely good. So not. we're on the same page uh, no, no. with that one. Well, let this Tucker drive sense. me around. I mean, you know, I, I trust him. Well, that's his second job, for sure. <laughs> exactly. Makes sense. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's pivot to the geopolitical front because another busy uh, weekend in the Middle East with the uh, Iranian attack on Israel response. Dr. Ariel Cohen joins us. He's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Dr. Cohen, thanks so much for joining us here. How would you characterize the, uh, I guess, the Iranian-backed uh, attack on Israel over the weekend? How would you characterize it? First of all, it's an overt act of war. Israel was attacked with 300 missiles, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones. The systems worked very well, both in CENTCOM, U.S. Central Command, that Israel was joined several years ago. That was the right decision uh, to integrate Israel with its Arab neighbors. Uh, and uh, the U.S., U.K., France, Saudi, uh, Jordan, and apparently UAE all participated in shooting down the Iranian missiles. But uh, this is just a first try by the Iranians, an unsuccessful try. Uh, the largest uh, drone and missile attack of the 21st century, uh, both uh, the Americans, the Israelis, uh, and the Iranians, the Russians, and the Chinese are going to learn, uh, do lessons learned from this, and um, probably uh, move to program to, to plan bigger and worse uh, strikes against each other. Mm. We saw many, many drone attacks in Ukraine. 
And um, one of the lessons learned is that massive drone type of swarms of drones, as we saw, uh, can be countered. Uh, so that's the good news. The bad news is the Iranian regime is dead set on destroying Israel. Uh, the chant every Friday in Tehran is death to America, death, death to Israel, and they will continue on their merry way. So, Dr. Cohen, um, the, the question yesterday was, is this the start of a direct war between Iran and Israel uh, and its allies, or was Iran's attack calibrated and telegraphed uh, retaliation? It sounds like you're in the former camp of that. Uh, it, <laughs> the direct war uh, of Iran against uh, the U.S. and Israel is going on since the days of the founder of the Islamic Republic, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, you remember uh, the American uh, CIA station chief was kidnapped uh, and tortured and then murdered in Lebanon in 1983, Colonel Buckley. And um, one way or another, I was covering or studying um, these events now for 40 years. Uh, so it's an ongoing uh, war, but this was an escalatory uh, operation. And this is the Middle East. Israelis sooner or later will have to retaliate, even as uh, President Biden is telling them uh, to step down and take a win when you have 300 mi missiles lobbed against your country. Uh, this is um, not going to stop there. So, Dr. Cohen, what do you think Israel's response will be and or should be? Uh, I think that as Israel has ongoing uh, business in Gaza, in the northern border against Hezbollah in Lebanon, um, they will not be able to um, launch a large scale attack against Iran. They shouldn't, not right now. Uh, but they have other tools, they have cyber. They were very successful with cyber attacks against the Iranian nuclear program. Um, and they have other means to disrupt uh, the Iranian military establishment and the Iranian economy. Will this sidestep in many ways containment of, of Russia. So I follow the oil markets and there is a narrative out there that, right. you know, if you wind up moving deeper into sanction territory or even enforcing the sanctions that are there on Iran, that opens up an avenue for Russia to sell more oil and make more money. How does the U.S. weigh these two events? Well, let me connect this to something the Biden administration just recently did. They put a freeze on our LNG uh, development going forward. And I think when we have malign actors like Russia, like Iran, uh, who are oil exporters, we, the United States, Canada, and others need to produce more, not less, oil and natural gas for the market. All right, Dr. Cohen, so I, I guess one of the questions here as we think about next steps is the position of, of Mr. Netanyahu within Israel itself. How is his grip on power? How is his ability to continue uh, to move forward with this, um, this conflict? Well, I was in Israel during the attack. Uh, the morale is high, but people are sick and tired of Netanyahu. If the elections uh, took place today, he would lose. Uh, and uh, his credibility is shot, both because of the criminal investigation that predate the Hamas attack of uh, October 7th, and because of the huge, unprecedented failure of the Israeli intelligence and the military on Netanyahu's watch. Uh, so he may be trying to uh, distract the attention to move on uh, towards the Iranian confrontation. I do not want to speculate, but uh, I think sooner or later, Israel will do the right thing. There'll be a judiciary com commission of inquiry like there was um, after the Yom Kippur War of 1973, when Israel also got a huge strategic surprise um, 50 years ago to the day of the um, attack uh, of October 7th. And after that com commission of inquiry, uh, there, there will be consequences for Netanyahu, up to and including uh, criminal proceedings. I don't want to speculate right now, but uh, he is politically a living corpse walking. 
All right, Doctor, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Dr. Ayla Cohen, uh, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council, um, has had extensive experience, 20 years. Uh, he served as a Senior Research Fellow in Russia and Eurasian Studies uh, and International Energy Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Wonderful to get his perspective. I think it, what's interesting, Paul, for the markets is how do you hedge the unthinkable? Yep. Like going into Friday, it's like, okay, you don't want to take risk into the weekend. You want to take some safety. But now... Now, yeah. how do you do that? I know, exactly. Like, do you sell and puts? Like, you know, I don't know. Well, some folks are some folks are selling oil here. Brent crude down uh, about 1.7 percent, still, you know, up around 89 dollars per barrel, but maybe a little bit of a, a breathe of a sigh of relief a little bit there. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and also, there's some narrative out there like, why would Iran want to hurt themselves even more on the oil right. front? Anyway, we'll discuss. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Let's get to Ben Emmons, Senior Portfolio Manager and Head of Fixed Income, uh, New Age Wealth. He joins us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Uh, ben, a million ways to go here, but let's start with uh, some of the economic data we got today. Some retail sales came in really strong here. Um, the consumer seems to be in pretty good shape, I guess. It still is, Paul. I think that uh, the employment reports are start to have an effect here, you know, um, because this was actually the numbers that were weak in January, February, as we talked about earlier. And if I look through these reports, you're seeing, um, you know, basically items that are going to be feeding directly into GDP that were up, uh, as well as those non-star sales. So I think what the market is doing today is to say, you know, GDP is once again accelerating. This brings us actually back to the summer of last year when we had a similar phase of having higher bond yields, started indicating that we're having a stronger economy, and this report then confirms it. So I think it's a, uh, yeah, this, this, this just shows once again, like, we just cannot be knocked off course here, no matter what gasoline prices are doing. Yeah. Gasoline yeah. sales are up too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the 10-year. I mean, rates are higher. Alex and I have been talking about this all day. Rates are up another 12 basis points on the 10-year to 4.65% here. The two-year, we're on a 5% watch here. Um, so the bond market's selling you, I don't know, rates are higher for longer, I guess. Higher for longer, and, and if you if you... If this continues, then the 10 is going to drift towards where the Fed funds rate is. Maybe not exactly, but not too far off. That would, I think, be a really interesting moment for markets because that means that if you're getting a 10 year and a Fed funds rate about equal, it puts a lot of, should put a lot of pressure on the economy. So, but I think for now, and this is our view, uh, that we're going to probably move into this 475 to 5% zone. You know, if this mm -hmm. type of data shows that that GDP is going to be upgraded and the PCE is going to be yeah. higher. We're going to have to expect that the yields are going to be continue to reflect better growth on top of the supply that we're going to continue to have. Right? It was very substantial treasury supply. So Ben, th that definitely means like a buy a tech thing because like they have the growth, they have the cash flow, um, they're not going to be subject to any of the refinancing, etc. But I'm wondering if this scenario just dents the rotation that we've seen. Right? This, I'm sure, is bad for small caps. What does it do to the cyclical s space? Yeah, you could think of that, that anything interest rate sensitive, as in the small cap space, mm -hmm. typically underperforms. Um, we have the view, though, that, that we think the rotation, you know, the financial energy rotation has really happened, that that's not so much derailed here. One, it shows today with Goldman Sachs, like it's just, you know, good trading environment. Mm -hmm. The energy market's obviously in play with because of the geopolitics. So I think that part of the rotation is, we think, is, is working. Um, but you're right about tech, like that you gotta let your winners ride, as, as, as Cameron said too, like we really have to not trade them, but, but basically invest in them and, and stay with them because that is, that is where, where, where it's happening in the economy. I think this is partly an impact too, once again, from all the infrastructure spending that starts to show up in the economy, making it each time stronger, right? So why are we getting so much uh, strength with unemployment rate, uh, unemployment, and then it feeds through spending. So I, I think, concluding, tech remains in, in, uh, in play here, uh, even though the 10 year yield may go to 5%. So, I mean, well, you're head of fixed income, so let me ask you. <laughs> I can sit in a two-year treasury at 4.95%. Should I do that, or should I go out on the credit curve a little bit and maybe look at some corporate bonds, whether it's an investment grade or high yield? How are you guys positioning? 
So it, I put a little uh, note out on, on Friday for New Edge. That was, I was sort of coming to the point of looking at the very short of the yield curve where anything that's floating rate, investment grade or treasuries, or even some to extent high yield, it's just performing like so incredibly stable because you're getting all this interest, right? So the, the spread of floating rate bonds ov over the treasury are anywhere between 200 and 300 basis points, mm. depending which area you're in. That's pretty attractive. You keep collecting that interest. And, and if you think about what's going on with the 10-year yields, so on Friday we rally a lot on geopolitics. We come in today, we have a completely opposite picture. That's a lot of volatility. So mm -hmm. I think from our point of view, you want to be a little bit more positioned there on the shorter end of the yield curve because the yield curve is not going to normalize much as the Fed's on hold. You collect all that interest and give you very stable performance and sort of wait it out until we get higher yields in the low end that at some point it's going to start slowing down the economy. We do think, though, that the buy zone for the 10-year will probably be in that 4 to 4 75 percent range, I would, would think, that a lot of people will start looking at it and buying. Uh, we probably, too. Do you think we get to 5 percent on the 10-year? I think it's fairly likely, and, and that's not just because of, of just today's number, but one thing with bonds currently is that if you look at term premium, as we call it, a little like wonky term, but if you take what's expected from the Fed for the next couple of years and where inflation is, and you take that out of the 10-year, there's almost no yield there. There's, there's very little compensation. And if I then judge the way this geopolitical event is played out against an economy that doesn't get off, thrown off course and stays above trend, the volatility of bonds, long-end bonds, will stay higher and should likely drive it a little bit up towards that 5%. Lastly, this refunding announcement that we're going to get, uh, I believe it's on April 29th, there was something really interesting, Alex, about the uh, TBAC, the advisory committee that put a presentation out a few weeks ago. They actually made a forecast that T-bill supply should decline, but the long-end supply should stay the same. Mm. If the Treasury follows through on that advice, that should be refracted into the yield curve, and that isn't right now, not enough, I think, because of a low-term premium. So I think for all these reasons, throwing the Fed to that the Fed's going to, cut's going to be more and more priced out, you're going to get to 5%. You believe the technical analysis from pre-financial crisis up until now, you look at ret retracements, you could go even as high as 5.3, which is where the Fed funds rate is. That would be pretty extreme, I think, and it would be a real buying opportunity. We think the zone comes into 475, 5%. So, the Fed, what's your call for 2024? Will they cut in 2024? So I was listening to Williams today, who went with Mike McKee, a yep. good interview. He still stays very confident that they can do it. But he, and he's important to listen to because he's actually the, the person that put out the, the, uh, the framework on how they want to do it. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if, if inflation continues to get on track down to 2%, even though it's slower now, that Fed, that Fed funds rate that's restrictive can be at some point cut down to take the restriction out. He thinks that's, that they're still on course with that. I do think though the markets are probably more rational now about than earlier this year and saying, yeah, that was not seven cuts. That's probably one to two mm -hmm. cuts. The, the window is obviously narrowed a lot, right? Because as much as Powell said in the interview, I think it was also with Mike McKee or anyone else said that the election didn't matter for them to make this rate decision. So I thought it was interesting. You, Probably they are going to keep that in mind, right? So the window. I'm giving Ben a look of like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right, right ben, ben Emmons. Yep. You go. Yeah, Ben. Thanks so much for joining us, Ben yeah. Emmons, uh, senior portfolio manager, head of fixed income at New Edge Wealth, uh, joining us live here on our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. Happy Monday, happy tax day. I'm Alex Steele alongside Paul Sweeney. We are live from Interactive Broker Studio right here in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, looking at the crude market here, you're looking at Brent down by about almost 2%, same for WTI. So you're now at 88 uh, for Brent, about 84 for WTI. So kind of what's next? Ellen Wald is president of Transversal Consulting, and she's a great person to talk to on the price and fundamentals, as well as the geopolitical risk. Just a handful of guys who do that really, really well. Um, Ellen, it's great to get your perspective. I've gotten so many notes from strategists this morning on sort of what they're, what's baked in now to the oil price. What's your call? What, what geopolitical premium is in? How much should be in? I think there's definitely some geopolitical premium that is uh, baked into oil prices, but I think it's been that way for some time now. Um, I think that 
because this attack happened over the weekend, the, the price action was really, really muted even more than uh, it would have been, uh, you know, it, it was otherwise considering that there was no oil supply that was involved or threatened in any way. Uh, and so we didn't even see any, uh, you know, potential ups and downs or, or brief spikes just because there was no trading going on. Uh, I think the, the question really is um, now that prices are kind of backing down, um, what's the next step? Where are things going? And if there are any indications indications that um, Israel is going to launch uh, further attacks against Iran, or there could be more retaliatory attacks from Iran, um, I think that could definitely cause oil prices to go up maybe another dollar or so. But we'd have to get some really strong indications that something incredibly major or explosive would happen in order, I think, for oil prices to really uh, spike higher and stay higher for longer. Ellen, talk to us about the demand side of the equation. Uh, before October 7th, that seemed to be the driver here of global oil prices, um, you know, the ups and downs of global demand. What are you seeing in terms of demand these days? Yeah, what we're looking at is, um, you know, we, we did see some pretty strong demand in the United States. Gasoline demand is not quite as strong this week as maybe it was uh, in previous weeks. But uh, when we go, uh, you know, and looking towards the summer, I think we're expecting to see pretty strong gasoline demand uh, over the summer in the U.S. And also um, what's going on with Asia, especially with China, because they're big drivers of demand as well. And uh, I think we're seeing some uh, reluctance in um, Asian uh, buyers to buy uh, oil or to, to order cargoes, more cargoes from the Middle East, because there's a concern about whether it will get there. And that's actually fueling demand uh, for American oil, mm -hmm. which could actually um, either push up the price of WTI or um, keep it a bit more elevated as opposed to, to coming back down uh, as the geopolitical premium uh, 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 goes down. So I think that it's it's kind of a complicated picture uh, and does depend obviously on the economic situation globally. If we see some kind of uh, more recession, we could see demand falter. But right now it looks pretty strong heading into the summer. Which brings us back to the supply picture, uh, Ellen. So when you were talking about stronger action from Iran. The, the elephant in the, in the room is closing the Strait of Hormuz, where a lot of oil passes through, and that would be a huge line in the sand for oil and would cause unbelievable spikes in the oil price. What is Iran's capacity to actually do that? Because they've gotten kind of a good gig under President Biden in terms of, you know, their, their exports are up, right? Their oil exports are up. Do they really want to mess with that? Exactly. And I think the only case in which Iran takes any kind of action to shut the streets of Hormuz to shipping. And so re remember what, we were, what we're talking about is this is a small passage and Iran could, um, you know, could do this in a number of ways. It could either block it with ships or it could fire missiles off of uh, nearby land that could make it uh, impossible for ships to traverse this area. But um, for them to really take that action means that Iran has nothing to lose. Uh, because if Iran cuts off other ships' abilities to go through that, then you're going to see the U.S. Navy cutting off Iranian ships' ability to, to come through the Straits of Hormuz as well. So Iran really has to have nothing to lose. And right now, it's got a lot to lose. Uh, it's got a very thriving uh, contraband oil industry going on. It's making a lot of money. And as oil prices go higher, um, even though Iran has to sell its oil at a discount, it's going to make more money. So uh, it doesn't want to mess with that. In fact, it probably wants to sell more oil to uh, you know, to to its buyers as opposed to to less. So, yeah. um, if Biden starts to mess with that by um, enforcing sanctions harder, then that could um, kind of stir things up and, and make things more tense. But right now, um, you know, unless Iran's oil industry is shut down, mm -hmm. is to say, if its oil industry was destroyed, then it might have the motive to do that because it's got nothing to lose. But, but it's that definitely not there yet. Is, I mean, just for yeah. perspective, like in March, uh, Iranian oil output hit a five year high of about 3.25 million barrels of oil a day. And the conversation we were having earlier with Dr. Ariel Cohen was, if uh, sanctions are lined up heavier on Iran so they can't export that much, that opens the door for Russia to start selling a little bit more as well. So talk to me about how you balance, um, as someone in the Biden administration, how do you balance those two? And where you, How do you do that? <laughs> Well, I think the Biden administration also has to come to terms with the fact that 
Um, its price cap policy uh, on on Russia is basically a failure. Um, it's not really stopping Russia from making oil on it, from making money on its oil industry. So yes, if Iran has less to offer, then Russia can fill in those gaps. But uh, I think there's also the issue of um, Russia's participation in the OPEC plus uh, output cuts. And if come June, oil prices are still in the 90s, then there's going to be a lot of pressure on OPEC to raise its output. And Russia is part of that. And Russia would love to sell more oil, obviously. So uh, this this whole whole thing is, is a very uh, complicated dance. Meanwhile, the Biden administration wants is going to want more oil on the market because it doesn't want high gasoline prices going into an election year. So uh, they both want Russian oil on the market. They just don't want Russia to make a lot of money off of that oil. Uh, but it seems like they can't really uh, uh, have both of those things. Well, Torsten Slock over at Apollo Management put out a, a chart today that for me, who's not an uh, oil expert, was really illuminating, which is saying the U.S. is the biggest oil producer in the world with yeah. about 12.9 million barrels per day. Why don't our friends in Texas and Oklahoma just start pumping out more oil here? Great question. And the answer is that this is not the same oil industry as it was in 2015, 2016, 2017, where it was all pump, 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 drill, 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 put out as much as you can. Uh, don't think about you know what you're selling it for, the returns. It's just growth, growth, growth. That's not the oil industry now. Um, there have been a lot of consolidations. Uh, oil companies are running very lean games. They've really cut out a lot of of uh, you know fat during the the pandemic and they're at a point where they don't have to produce producers they don't have to grow in order to satisfy uh you know their uh you know their their shareholders they're they're sitting very well um sometimes you know they may drill more wells but it's become much more expensive inflation we all think about oil prices causing inflation but what we don't often think about is how inflation acts on oil production. And so everything costs more to drill now. And so they may see a benefit in not expanding drilling so much. They are increasing production by getting more out of every well, but there isn't necessarily a benefit to drill, drill, drill when uh, you know they've got a good thing going right now and it's becoming more difficult to uh, drill more in terms of the prices, the supplies, and all of that. So, uh, and, and there's there's less incentive for them to do that at the moment. All right, here I'm gonna go all oil nerd on you, Paul, nice. right? Okay, all oil nerd for you. The U.S. produces a different type of oil than the oil you're gonna get in the Middle East. Sweet crude. Yes. Yes. Light sweet crude. Light, well, okay. light sweet. Light sweet. Hey, John Tucker. We were just talking about <laughs> do, gasoline uh, do prices. For, yeah, very sad for, for you. Just real quick. Mm. Boil. B O I L. It's a go. great function. All the different types of oil. It's like sixty different yeah. types of oil. And, and all of them have different qualities, and you can use them to refine into different kind of products. Uh, so even if the U.S. was producing like you know forty million barrels of oil a day, which obviously is like not possible, um, it wouldn't make up for the loss that you'd see in some of the Middle Eastern countries because they have the heavier stuff, which is really good for other products. So. That is your Thanks Alex Blaine of the morning. You are so welcome, <laughs> um, Ellen. Thank you very much, Ellen Wald, a president of Transversal Consulting, uh, joining us there. There was also an interesting article, I think it was in the journal, that U.S. oil executives finally have a direct line to the White House, that like oh. now their calls won't be rejected and they actually can go and talk to the Biden administration. So I, I, that's that was quite once interesting. A thing? Oh, yeah. Like a few years ago, ridiculous. when uh, first time gasoline prices went to five dollars, I asked a CEO of a major oil company in the U.S., "Has the Biden administration called you?" He's like, "Not even tried." Wow. Yeah, but now that may be changing a little bit. So there yeah, you go. I would think so. I mean, we think need our oil and gas industry as long as, as well as we need the green stuff. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We're going to get back to geopolitics front and center yet again. Aaron David Miller joins us, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace joining us in Washington, D.C. via that thing called Zoom. All right, Aaron, talk to us about kind of how you view the Iranian response, the Israeli defense uh, over the weekend here. Where, where do we go from here? No, I think it's a story, thanks for having me, of what I would describe as the good, the, good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, the good is easy. Uh, Israel's technical mastery 
of air defense backstopped by the United States, its military aircraft and um, air defenses by the Europeans, the French and the Brits, and uh, not surprisingly, but I think in an unprecedented fashion by key Arab states who participate in this Middle East uh, air defense uh, alignment of, of, of radars and intelligence, which is unprecedented. There's never been a Middle East war where at least, at least the Israelis received that kind of support, including open support from the Jordanians who downed a number of drones. That's that's the good news. The, the bad and potentially ugly news is, number one, in a real war, and I think the Iranians actually telegraphed this and calculated and calibrated it um, so that um, they wouldn't prompt uh, a, a massive Israeli response. In a real war, the Iranians would probably launch thousands of missiles and drone drones. Um, that's number one. Number two, you have new rules established now. I mean, it was 33 years, it's been 33 years since any Arab state attacked Israel directly. That was Saddam Hussein in 91, who launched 43 Scud missiles. Then Prime Minister Shamir was persuaded by the Bush, first Bush administration not to respond. But you now have new rules between Iran and, um, and Israel. Um, established in a rivalry that's strategic and for which there's no solution. So we're now forced to deal with the cruel realities that we're at best going to be managing this and trying to contain it. Mm -hmm. The Israelis have made it unmistakably clear, I think, that they intend to respond. The timing and the scale of that response, I think, is still very much up in the air. Maybe they'll look for a calibrated response mm -hmm. uh, that reinforces uh, what has clearly been obvious, which is Israel's technical mastery and superiority uh, over Iran. But there's no guarantee, of course, once you go up the escalatory ladder, that Iran won't respond, and then you raise the issue of Hezbollah. So <clears> you know, so that's so kilometers so away. Sure. That's not hours away. The Hezbollah launches yeah. missiles that not going to take hours to get to Israel, and they got a lot of them. Aaron, this is a pretty grim picture that, that you're painting at this point. Um, what are the chances that that's how it's going to play out? Or is there a real ability for President, De President Biden to defuse this? You know, defusing would mean meeting Iran's and Israel's uh, core requirements. Uh, I'm not predicting regional war, which would mm -hmm. lead to dramatic spike in oil prices and probably plunging financial markets and a degree of instability the Middle East has never experienced before. Um, it's a matter of managing and containing. That's the question. Because there's no solution to deal with the fact, reality, that Iran is a nuclear weapons threshold state. There's no real solution to deal with Iran's proxies. It, that's always been a, manage, a management issue, whether the Houthi, Houthis are shelling international shipping, forcing shippers to go around the Cape of Good Hope, which is an additional 3,500 miles, which raises rates and interferes with the global supply chain. There are no determinative, comprehensive answers uh, to any of this. Mm -hmm. And if we need to complicate it even more, you have an Israeli-Hamas war, although the Israelis seem to have scaled down their ground campaign in Gaza, that uh, carries so many uncertainties, including the fate of 134 hostages, 30 of whom the Israelis believe were either killed in captivity uh, or died on October 7th, their bodies taken to Gaza to trade for Palestinian prisoners. So, you know, I wish I could make you happy. Um, but I, again, I'm not predicting we're going to a, a major regional war, but I guess my takeaway here is it's going to require a degree of restraint mm -hmm. from Iran and Israel and to a certain degree, um, some diplomacy from the Biden administration, particularly right. with Israelis. Aaron, uh, do we have any clearer picture today than we did on October 8th, what really the end goals are for Israel here? What would be a victory? Um, a victory, I guess, would be uh, three things. Number one, Hamas would be, not as a political force, but as a military force, would be undermined and, uh, <clears throat> um, and destroyed. So it would not be in a position to pull off another another October 7th. Israel would kill the senior leadership responsible for the October 7th attacks and the redemption of the hostages. 
if those three things were accomplished, that would be, I think you could put that in the victory category. Although the price of victory, the price of victory is something that needs to be factored in into this, particularly when it involves the exponential rise of Palestinian deaths and the humanitarian catastrophe, catastrophic starvation, Samantha Power, the aid administrator, administrator even used the word several days ago, um, a famine. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure the Israelis can accomplish those three things. Uh, right now, six months into the war, there's no indication. Uh, right, They have not killed the senior leadership. You've got a truly tragic situation with respect to hostages, particularly the women hostages. And you, you have a situation where Hamas, probably out of their 30,000 fighters, has have at least 10,000 fighters that remain. So I, I, I think we're talking here, again, about a, a lot of uncertainties. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just don't see a, a sort of determinative ending where Gaza becomes secure and stable. The Israelis and the Saudis normalize in the Middle East remains a uh, or is converted into a happy conflict place or everybody's getting along with one another all right aaron thanks a lot we really appreciate it uh aaron david miller senior fellow at carnegie endowment for international peace uh, is standing by and, and then uh, or thank you for joining us um i have to wonder then you know as an investor how do you we're, it just means we're going to be very sensitive to any yep. kind of headline that's going to cross, which is maybe what we're seeing in the market sort of right now. And it's going to make the overall data that we see. I wonder how much more relevant that's going to be when these headlines can be very effective. Yeah, um, it seems like, uh, you know, just to date, the market has kind of powered through um, all of this Middle East tension, mm -hmm. uh, much as it has. Uh, the European uh, geo conflict in Ukraine seems to just generally bypass it and focusing on, you know, maybe a little bit more local issues, i.e. central bank policy, uh, corporate earnings. Um, so it may be a day to day basis. There might be some That's volatility right, yeah. from this. But if you look at this market really since October, which was, you know, kind of the, the low of this market, um, you know, S&P up about 25 percent during that time here. So uh, despite all the geopolitical tensions around the world, much, much hotter than I think anybody would like to see, uh, this market is, is moving higher. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.